First, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello everyone, welcome to Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler, I appreciate you all joining us wherever you're fighting this show, whether you're live or not, this is a live shot as we're recording this from Seaside, Oregon right there with our camera out there, it looks pretty great, but I'm showing that for a reason because that is of course out there on the Oregon coast and on Sunday, January 26th, we will have a 325th anniversary of a giant tsunami that hit that coast right there. And that is because we had a huge earthquake, a 9.0 earthquake at the Cascadia subduction zone just off the Oregon coast out there in the Pacific Ocean. Again, we are live streaming here on our Fox 12 Oregon apps at kptv.com. Plenty of places to find this show, watch it live or watch it afterward. But yeah, 325 years ago, the year 1700 was when that earthquake happened. Probably if you've been in the Northwest for any amount of time, you know about the big one. Which is, which is supposed to be the next giant earthquake that's going to happen at that subduction zone there right off of the coast. And it uh, obviously has not happened yet. It's estimated it can happen anywhere between three to 600 years-ish. That's a very wide range of time, but it does kind of put us in that zone where something could happen. So we talked to U of O about some of the work that they are going to be doing there, in particular Valerie Zahekian, and uh, discussing just some of the different ways that they are researching that, the way they found out about when this earthquake happened, and uh, some of the ways that they monitor, and things that you can do to prepare even for the event, in the event that this big one does happen in your lifetime. So uh, a lot of really good information in this, and we'll just go ahead and play it right now. But here we go, the 325th anniversary of that earthquake. All right, well, Valerie, thanks for having some time to talk to us about this. Uh, you know, certainly so at some point, this is going to be a very big thing that we're all going to experience here in the Northwest. We don't know exactly when that is, but we do know about 325 years ago, uh, one happened. And I was hoping you could talk to us about that you know, earthquake in, in 1700, what happened there? And, and maybe how do we know what exactly happened? Yeah, it's actually a really interesting story. So, um, you know, for some context here in the Northwest, we live in the Cascadia subduction zone. So are there these tectonic plates that make up the surface of our earth? And the one that's underneath our ocean is sinking underneath our continent. And that builds up stress um, in between the plates and it can break um, in a really big earthquake. So sometimes medium earthquakes, sometimes really big ones that can break from California to Canada. And that's what we think happened on January 26, 1700. Um, so what happens is when you have one of these earthquakes, we'll have really strong shaking um, from the coastal regions into the valley. The coast itself, the land will drop down four to eight feet um, immediately. And then there will be a tsunami wave that comes in. It's kind of like a tide, but it moves faster. And it's like a tide that rises 30 to 40 feet. And so the reason that we know that there is one in 1700 is from a few different things. One is we can see it in the geology. So when we look at the geology, we can see that the coast dropped down and that it was around 1700. Um, and we can see that there's, um, you know, things left behind from a tsunami at that time. But really the big thing is that on January 26, 1700, there are records from Japan that talk about an orphan tsunami. Um, so in Japan, they aren't strangers to earthquakes and tsunamis, but was what was odd to them is in their documentation of this earthquake, they didn't feel any shaking before the tsunami came in, which is why they called it an orphan tsunami. And so we know exactly when that tsunami arrived there, and they have records of how high the damage was um, on the rice paddies and, and from stories at the time. And so we can back that out, figure out where and when that occurred, and that it had to have been about a magnitude nine earthquake um, only in about in the Northwest area that, that could have created that. And so that gives us the exact day and we even know that it probably happened in the evening on that day. Wow, that is so incredible to have that kind of specific information. I mean, and thankfully, you know, people were keeping those records in Japan to do that. But I mean, that is a massive earthquake, 9.0. And so looking at, you know, what we expect, I guess, what is the normal time range that we're dealing with as far as when one of those earthquakes would occur? Um, they tend to happen about every four to 500 years here, um, not exact. Um, so it you know, couldn't be, it might be another couple hundred years, but it also could be tomorrow. We don't really know. Um, and then, you know, we can, if it, we have another earthquake of that size, which we will, it's just a question of when, we can expect kind of similar things, you know, so we can extract, expect very strong to strong shaking along the entire coast from Mendocino all the way up into Canada. And then we will probably feel that strong shaking into the valley, um, like in Oregon, Washington, and California. Um, we will probably see a tsunami of about the same size. 
And then we'll also see other things like we will probably see landslides in the coast ranges and in steep areas. And we might see liquefaction where the in the valleys where the ground kind of liquefies and turns a little bit into soup in some places before it dries out. Uh, all that's, you know, pretty horrifying to think about, but I mean, important to know that that is going to happen. So just one quick cl uh, clarifying question there. So that last one, the ground dropped four to eight feet, I believe is what you said. So you think that that will happen when this when this next big earthquake does occur? Yes, if there's an earthquake of that size, the, the ground at the coast will drop that much. So not inland, but only just at the coast. Just at the coast. Now, um, how do you go about monitoring for everything right now? I know that's one of the things that U of O is participating with a number of organizations, but what are the ways that we monitor for this and, and kind of keep track of what we can as far as determining maybe when the next earthquake could occur? Yeah, well, we cannot predict earthquakes, um, but what we can do is we can do as much now to learn about what we can expect and earthquakes to prepare for them. So. Um, we can learn about how strong we think shaking is going to be here, and then we can make sure we build our infrastructure so that it can, you know, sustain that kind of shaking. Um, and then we can also do other monitoring efforts, like even though we cannot predict earthquakes, what we can use is earthquake early warning. So when an earthquake happens, it sends out different types of seismic waves. Some of those seismic waves travel very quickly, but they don't make much shaking. Those are called P waves. And then when we, what we can do is we can put instruments out that will feel those P waves and it will very quickly in a matter of fractions of a second figure out how big the earthquake is and where. And it can then give us, you know, several seconds to 10 seconds of warning before the next set of waves which are the damage size. And so we, that means we can't predict it, but we can say I have, you know, five to 10 seconds to get out of this building to, uh, you know, stop, turn off a gas line to stop a train, things like that. Wow, so that would give it enough time. So that's that's crazy that, that these instruments are so precise like that. That's that's really amazing. So when you're talking about that kind of technology, how many sensors, I don't know if there's an actual number that you would have, but I mean, generally speaking, how many sensors and how far of a coverage do we have for this? Uh, well, the more sensors you have, the more accurate it is. Um, but yeah. currently, our seismic networks that are um, run out of University of Oregon and University of Washington, they have hundreds of seismometers, and those are everywhere from the coast um, all the way, you know, past the Cascade, out east past Bend. I um, mean, they, they cover the majority of um, part of that area in California, Oregon, Washington. And when those, uh, say, some of those monitors got that notification of those waves hitting it, there is a system to get those alerts out to people. Could you tell us just a little bit about that and how people would, would get a notification of, even if it is six to ten seconds or whatever it is, to, to be prepared? Um, well, there's an app you can download. I believe it's called MyShake. So that is one way you can get the warning on the app. Um, there will also be WIA alerts. So those are just kind of like the Amber Alerts or Weather Alerts that you hear. Um, those will also go out um, on your phone or on the radio. And what are some of the different ways that, that U of O is working with other communities and organizations to monitor for, uh, for this earthquake and, and just keep track of what's going on in general? Uh, there are a number of things. So the Oregon Hazards Lab works with the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, and they run these seismic networks. Um, they also have lots of other sensors that are out that are telling us about, you know, other geologic-related things um, related to these processes. Um, so that's a big part of the monitoring effort. Um, we also have a lot of research going on here um, and in other places. So currently the Cascadia Region Earthquake Science Center is a National Science Foundation center that's studying earthquakes and their impacts. Um, so we're trying to ask the science questions that we need. We need to learn about to better understand these earthquakes and what they do and the things they cause. And then we're also trying to work with, um, you know, state agencies, um, like the, the geological agencies and such, to try and understand what are the ways we can work together to use that science to address societal needs to prepare for it. And with all of the research that we have from the past of knowing about the 1700 earthquake, all the research that we're doing now, where does this look for the future? I mean, I guess maybe with the advent of more technology, does this increase our abilities to monitor things like this and utilize the information that you're getting in? Well, with, you know, with more sensors and um, with better technology, we can definitely, you know, maybe get better estimates on early warning. If we understand the earthquakes themselves a little bit better, then the monitoring can help us more quickly identify how big of an earthquake it is, when the tsunami is going to come, where, how big. Um, a lot of it is really in the advancements that we make, not in monitoring, but in sort of like understanding what the hazard is going to be, and then working with engineers and emergency management agencies to prepare for that. Um, so what this research really gives us is it puts us um, at what gives us better footing to understand what kind of shaking we're likely to expect, 
where we might expect there to be landslides and how big, what we can expect for a tsunami. Um, and those kinds of things can then help us prepare better um, so that our infrastructure and such can can weather that damage and help us be more resilient. And I still working with, I'm assuming, a lot of different governmental organizations and communities and understanding and getting that information out when when you have it, when you're able to, to interpret all of that data to figure out where where some of the issues could lie. Yeah, that's right. Um, really quick, I want to just go back to one thing you mentioned. Um, you know, when this next earthquake does occur, do you think that it's going to be somewhere in that 9.0 range? And if so, could you just tell us a little bit more about that tsunami and how big that potentially could be? Yeah, I don't think we know that it will be exactly a nine, but that is a possibility. And, you know, that tsunami could be, you know, 30, 40 feet or higher. It just depends. And, you know, oftentimes people think a tsunami is a, like a crashing wave, but it's actually more like a tide. So it's like a tide that will come in very quickly over the course of tens of minutes and then leave. Um, and so that tide will rise, you know, 30, 30 or more feet at the coast will come in. It'll come in very quickly and then it'll also leave very quickly so that it'll create very strong currents that can, um, you know, move. Yeah, moving all of those those things around. Um, and and I still, just going back to what you were talking about at the beginning, just the fact that you know all of this from that 1700 quake, I think is really great. And, you know, uh, anything else that you think is really important just for the public to know in general about the work that you're doing there at UFO and uh, just preparing for, you know, someday this earthquake will happen, whether it's tomorrow or 100 years from now, it will happen. So uh, just what you're doing there for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think a lot of the things we're doing is we're, we're trying to work on the science that helps understand hazard does it. Um, and, and then kind of link that to what we know about the infrastructure and resilience right now. So as it stands right now, we expect that there's probably going to be a lot of damage if there's an earthquake like this. So, you know, we expect somewhere around $30 billion of losses, probably damage to bridges, fire stations, hospitals, airports and runways, our roadways. Um, and those kinds of things can really impact how long it takes us to bounce back after an earthquake like this. Um, so a lot of the things we're trying to do is the science so that we know how to better prepare. Um, and, you know, even before we have those answers, I think we sort of know things already. So things I would say are, you know, create plans for yourself. So um, you can look at resources online at, you know, FEMA's website and the Oregon Department of Emergency Management to understand what we can expect for the impacts. You can look at your communities and figure out how high would you need to go if there's a tsunami and make a plan for how to get there. Um, and then be two weeks ready. So that's what the um, OEM suggests is make sure that you have enough supplies and a plan in place to be self-sufficient for two weeks if something like this happens. Um, and those are really good ways to prepare. Valerie, thank you so much for having time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's fascinating work that you're doing and just learning about just the geology, you know, the geological side of things, but also just the ramifications of this and and uh, get, gathering all this information, you know, all of all of this data that can really help people out and help better understand what's happening right there off the coast, right there off the coast of Oregon. Um, well, Valerie, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That was great. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, all that was amazing. And again, uh, really appreciate uh, her joining us. I'm going to pull that up here once again to taking a look there at the coastline and where that uh, could happen. So thank you to Valerie for uh, joining us for that segment. There's also going to be something on, uh, on Sunday on the actual anniversary at, at the Art House in Eugene. They're going to be showing a film called Rumblings, which is all about preparing for the next earthquake. So something else, if, if you want to go down there and uh, find out more about what's being done to get ready for this, what you should be aware of. So a lot of information happening surrounding this anniversary, but we really appreciate that time and uh, her joining us. And thanks for joining us as well, for watching this, whether you're watching live on the Fox 12 Oregon apps, highly recommend you download those. If you don't have them, whatever device that you happen to be on, that could be a fire stick, it could be your phone. We are live here from the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom. That's what you see behind me uh, as, we're, uh, as we're live streaming this. But all these videos and segments are available afterward for you to watch as well. So. Definitely go there, check all those out. We are live streaming here every weekday starting at 1 p.m. going throughout the afternoon. And uh, please uh, stick around for, for this afternoon. If there's ever breaking news, we'll have that as well. All right here on Fox 12 Now.